There's a storm across the valley The clouds are rolling in The afternoon is heavy on your shoulders There's a truck out on the four lane A mile or more away The whining of his wheels just makes it colder. Welcome to Community Forum. Today is January 9th, 2020, and my name is Priscilla Almquist Olson, your host, and I am so privileged and honored today to welcome one of uh, another townie here from Easton, uh, Edward Leonard. And Ed uh, grew up in Easton, uh, but he has so many more stories to tell us. And we're going to have a two-part section. Today we will talk uh, about uh, two stories, and we will continue on another segment to uh, talk about three other stories. He is very well versed in Easton's history, and he's also doing research on the William Ladd family. So we don't want to uh, keep you on this show longer than you can um, s tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to do two shows. So please tune in to the uh, second segment of this amazing and very interesting, and I can assure you, entertaining story. Ed, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I just heard that his mother was 100% Swedish. <laughs> And so am I. <laughs> anyway. That's another episode. Huh? Oh, I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> the Swedish connection, there you go. we'll call it. All right. So tell me a little bit about, uh, I know that you said you were born in Brockton and in your very early years lived there in the Swedish section of Campello. But tell me, when did you come to Easton? Um, How I old were you? I, I was a six years old. I had just finished the first grade in Brockton. Uh, and my family moved from Brockton Heights, which is now the Westgate Shopping Center. Oh, okay. I moved from there to uh, 17 Columbus Avenue, and we rented a house from Harry DeWitt. Oh. Uh, and I began school in the second grade with Miss O'Connor as my first second grade teacher. So. And tell me a little bit about your, your f pals growing up and the kinds of <coughs> activities that you were involved in, because our listening audience uh, has no idea of the freedom and independence mm. that we enjoyed back then. Yeah. Well, I just watched <coughs> your episode with uh, Wayne Lake and uh, um, Alice, Kent. Alice Kent McCarthy. And uh, McCarthy, yes. And they were both classmates of my brother, graduated in 1948. Uh, and my background was taken off from there because I was born in 34. And then when we moved to Easton, it was the beginning of World War II. And uh, a lot of my activity was supporting the war effort. Uh, we had war bonds, we could get 10 cent stamps to to uh, make up a $18.50 booklet, and then you get a $25 war bond. Um, I collected all kinds of metal and copper and everything from the woods in my neighborhood, just up the street in Columbus Avenue, which is now the campus of a high school. But back then, it was my playground. And uh, so <coughs> I spent a lot of time collecting that, that and milkweed pods for the life preservers. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <coughs> Yeah. And then my neighbors, uh, <coughs> we played out in the street. We played until dark, and then we went home. Parents never worried about us. <laughs> um, Did you ever go to Frothingham Park and play? I played a lot of tennis in Frothingham Park. I was on the swings that they talked about, that merry-go-round, you remember? Oh, yeah. um, <coughs> but uh, I used to put my tennis balls in Mo Mason's backyard. He didn't like that <laughs> because I was traipsed traipsing through his, traipsing through his uh, garden. In other words, you lopped them to his backyard when you were playing well, tennis. Well, you'd miss a ball and, you know, right. up it go and down, 
bounce off the back of his house and back into the garden. Now, Mo Mason, uh, Mo was his nickname. Yep. And, uh, but his first name was John. And he was, uh, he taught me civics uh, in high school. But he was best remembered, I think, as the director of athletics. Right. Uh, although I'm sure he was not very athletic himself. Mm. But maybe when he was younger. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and uh, what were some of the, um, do you remember any sp special event that occurred growing up in high school, in, well, junior high or high school with your pals? That what? Any, any special events or activities that you did that you enjoyed with your pals? Yes, yeah, so when I <coughs> was in high school, I wasn't into athletics. And like Wayne Legg and uh, Alice Kent, we worked. And I spent a lot of my hours working and not playing baseball, football, whatever. So I wasn't a friend of Jack Mason's. <laughs> uh, and I had a, I inherited a car for a dollar from Harold Wheaton Haywood. You'll come in later in phase two of this discussion. Uh, 30 Chevrolet. And we spent a lot of time painting it. Did a motor job on it. And one of the uh, incidents that I remember drastic, you know, very familiar was you could take the handle, I mean the uh, steering wheel off of the car with one nut. And we would come down Baldwin Street, uh, uh, Barrow Street, and Harry had a wrench on the, on the shaft for the steering. And I had the steering wheel in my hand and we'd go by some girls walking home, and I'd hang the, the steering wheel <laughs> out the window, <laughs> and we'd go around the corner, because <laughs> Harry's steering for the wrench. <laughs> oh, that is funny. So there's a lot of stories like that. Yeah, and, yeah. and what year was that car? 1930 Chevrolet, and it was not an antique. No, right, 1931. Right, uh, Chevrolet. Yeah. My first car was a 1951 Chevrolet, and I wish I had that today. It was a great car. And it's, um, the steering wheel was, um, it was wood. Yep. And it was very shiny. It must have been shellac. Yep. And I sold it for $50. Just think what I could have gotten <laughs> for it today. <laughs> <laughs> I bought mine for a dollar from Harry because I promised <coughs> to help him paint his next car, which was a 40 Ford. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being in a very bad accident on Route 138, Andy Miller who was one of the superintendents of school in Easton, and his best friend, Dave Gomes, were in the back seat. And I got rear-ended, and I ended up with my head in Andy's lap in the back seat, and gasoline pouring out of the gas tank. Oh, my. And the guy hit me dead center with a 40 Chevy, and the ornament stuck and broke off into the back of my car. <coughs> I pulled over. The floorboards are wooden, and they flipped up. We survived it, um, luckily. How old were you? 16. Oh, my. Yeah. And <laughs> I remember because my dad was always afraid of me driving. He was in his automobile business all his life, and he knew a 16-year-old with his own cow would get into trouble. <laughs> well, Cully Palm. Oh, sure. Yeah, he was an officer. Well, there were only two. Cully was one of them. And he... Uh, Back in the day, two came police officers. Came to the officers. accident, and I asked him if he would come home with me to explain what happened to my father, because my father <laughs> wouldn't believe me. <laughs> so well, I can remember standing in the front door of the house and walking in, and my father sitting in the living room, and he saw Officer Palm in his uniform. <laughs> oh, what did he do now? <laughs> <laughs> Carl says, Marty, sit still. Nothing happened, everything's okay, and it's not your, your, your son's fault. So anyway, the car was totaled. I ended up driving it to college my freshman year at Northeastern, and, uh, but I couldn't afford to keep it, and my dad said, get that junk out of the yard. So I sold it to a fellow by the name of Ray Ladd. Uh -huh. I don't know that he was related to the lads we're going to be talking about. Yeah. But I think he was the son of Wendell Ladd that had the gas station down on 138th. Yes, Wendell. And, you know, I, when I thought back about 
Bill Ladd, and uh, I, I confused him with Wendell Ladd mm. because I thought Bill Ladd owned the gas station at Daly's Corner, and that's not the case. It no. was Wendell. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to um, uh, your you're 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 in the six you're sixteen seventeen, and well, I started off fourteen working at the library. Oh, let's talk about that. Yeah, well, that's what I'd like to start with because. Sure. Um, I was still riding a bicycle, but somehow I ended up with a job as taking care of the outside of the Ames Free Library, uh, mowing the lawn, picking the leaves, and shoveling snow. Uh, Irene Smith, I think, was the librarian following Miss Lamprey. Um, I changed a few light bulbs. And I can remember David Ames coming in a little brown uh -huh. envelope with the correct money for my week's wages. <laughs> One of the things that he did uh, also was take me to the Cuisset House next door and back oh, yeah. after a very big snowstorm. And he walked me up through the front door, up the stairs, through a bedroom, out through a window onto the front porch, shovel the snow off the roof. <laughs> wow. So anyway, I remember Dave as being a very businesslike person. Nice, very nice, but he was always dressed in a in a suit and tie, and it was Mr. Ames to me. Mm. So I enjoyed working there at the, in the library, and it, from there I ended up going over to work for Bill Ladd at the hardware store mm. when I was 16, and now I had my license and a car. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got into this story of Bill Ladd and then ultimately his, his father. Now, how did you get that job at the Ladd Hardware, Hardware Store? I would like to think that David Ames put a good word in for me with uh -huh. Bill Ladd. Mm -hmm. Bill moved into town with his wife, Betsy. Oh, by the way, did you know her maiden name? Uh, Cofill. No, Ross. She oh, was Ross. A, she was Elizabeth Ross from Sharon. Oh. I.E. Betsy Ross? Yeah. <laughs> but any rela no relation? Betsy Ross? Was she related to Betsy Ross? No, but she was called Betsy, Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross, right. <laughs> and she had a daughter, Betsy Ross, which I understand you used to babysit. That's right. I used to babysit Betsy, the daughter of Bill Ladd yeah. and Betsy Ladd. Yeah. Yeah. So and, anyway, and I... And they live in the, the uh, Canary Yellow House um, on Main Street. Um, if you're coming from Maine and going down to Daly's Corner, it's on the right-hand side, uh, sort of diagonally across from Fred's Pond. Right. And it's Langwater a, Pond. It's a wonderfully old, uh, it has a honey bee oven in it, and I was just so fascinated by it. I was, a, I was probably 12 or 13 when I babysat. That's in the last part of my story. Oh, good. The history of the Canary House. Oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, so um, but tell us a little bit about Bill's dad, Dr. William Ladd. Well, <coughs> first of all, I'd like to talk about working for Bill Ladd sure. at the hardware store. And in the, in the conversation over three years working for him, he mentioned that his father was a doctor in Boston, but it didn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. The thing that amazed me was how agile Bill Ladd was. And he was a graduate with David Ames from Milton Academy in high school. He was a graduate of Harvard School, Harvard University with David Ames. So they were good friends way back. And he moved into town in 1950, 1949. I think it was 1949, yeah, 1949. And that's when I went to work for him. So he had just bought this hardware store, but it wasn't just a hardware store, that was the front half. The back half was a fix-it shop, if you would. And they had an operating forge left over from the carriage works. Uh, we did ornamental iron work. I operated the forge when you uh, want to sharpen a pickaxe or, or a, uh, uh, any other large tool, like a crowbar, you didn't grind it sharp. You put it into the forge, you heat it up white hot, put it on the anvil and pound it into a sharp point, and then quench it in the water. And so Bill was teaching me all of this stuff, but I was really hired to sharpen lawnmowers. And back in those days, there were no rotary mowers. They were all reel type. Mm -hmm. You had a rotating reel and a bed knife. <clears throat> and so he taught me how to sharpen using that equipment. He taught me how to use the forge 
He taught me how to bend iron and thread. We threaded pipe and all. One of the things we made was a uh, heavy iron uh, semicircle of steel bar, which was like eight inches wide, a half inch thick, four feet long, and we had to bend it into a semicircle for belts or malleable foundry. Because when they made their castings, they had to grind off the bosses that stuck out. Mm -hmm. And they would put it up to a grindstone and the, the, uh, the uh, uh, stuff that would be ground off mm -hmm. would hit that shield and they would wear out. So he'd get an order for a half a dozen of those. Mm -hmm. We'd put an arc on the wooden floor with a, with a uh, chalk and then we'd grind it through rollers to bend it. It would take a half a day to bend one of them, <laughs> never mind a half a dozen of them. But anyway, Bill taught me all of that. And I'm thinking about that. Bill went to Harvard, and they didn't have an engineering school that I know of. He must have had a business degree. And David Ames had a business degree. They were classmates. So he comes into Easton in 1949. He rents the house from an Ames, the Canary House. He buys this hardware store. And he's teaching me how to do all this mechanical stuff. I'm saying, how did he ever do that? And David Ames certainly didn't know how to do it. <laughs> so anyway, it, it always amazed me that he, he did that. But my wife gave me this book, The Great Halifax Explosion. And on page 567, <coughs> There's an article about David about uh, William Ladd Sr., Dr. William Ladd. And I'm, I'm reading that, and I'm thinking about working for Bill Ladd here. I said, that must be his father. Mm -hmm. So I looked into that, and sure enough, it was. So part of my story continues from working on the hardware store mm -hmm. to looking into his, his uh, participation. This is his father here. It's, William Ladd, Dr. William Ladd. And how did uh, Bill get involved with all of this? Mm. So anyway, I'll, I'll talk about that later. But <clears throat> um, it was a lot, of, a lot of fun working there. That was a big part of my life for three years, working for Bill Ladd. Mm. And um, so you talk about um, the carriage shop, yep. which you call, you know, and, uh, it's amazing because if if he were, I mean, he was educated at Milton Academy in Harvard. Certainly, no places where vocational skills that you describe are taught. So he must have probably just studied it, or maybe he he went and uh, viewed um, places which use this t um, technology and so forth. I would like to know the answer to that, and I would like to talk to uh, Fred Ames. To Mm -hmm. son of David Ames, mm -hmm. because Fred Ames was a good friend of one of Dave, Bill Ladd's children, oh. James. Mm -hmm. They grew up together, and, and Fred told me that he palled around with James Ames for quite a bit. As James young. Ladd. Did he? You mean James Ladd? Yes. Yeah. Is he still alive? I'm sorry? Is James Ladd still living? I don't know. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. Fred... Ames would know that, yeah. but I haven't had a chance to okay. sit down, and I want to do that mm -hmm. because I'd like to know that sure. in, in, uh, interaction. And he would have known perhaps what the background of Bill Ladd's was before mm -hmm. he came to Easton. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so the next thing you're going to talk about is the Wheaton family genealogy, right? No, no? we're going to talk about William, Dr. William Ladd. Okay. That's my second story. All right, second story coming up. Okay. Um, the Great Halifax Explosion, which highlighted the activity of the participation of Dr. Ladd, uh, sparked my interest because um, nobody seems to remember anything about the Great Halifax Explosion. But one of the things that we all know is that Boston gets a Christmas tree every year from Halifax, Nova Scotia, mm. thanking the participation of Boston people in recovering from that explosion. So um, 
to bring people up to date on that explosion, there were two ships in Halifax Harbor, which is very protected. It's like a couple miles in from the, the ocean. Mm. And during World War I, ships would go in there and get supplies and drop off soldiers and pick up soldiers. There was quite a bit of commerce going on there. Uh, Halifax was a rapidly expanding city. Um, so this munition ship up from New York, loaded with TNT, was late in coming into the Narrows into Halifax Harbor. At the same time, there was a, a uh, that was the Mont Blanc. Uh, there was the Emo, which was a Norwegian ship, cargo ship, wanting to leave the harbor. But because of the lateness of the day, they had dropped the chains across the channel to prevent German submarines from entering the harbor. So here's this munition ship outside the harbor, this cargo ship inside the harbor, both wanting to enter the harbor. So in the morning when they lifted the chains, in goes the munition ship, out comes the cargo ship. And the cargo ship wasn't obeying all of the navigation rules, and it was cutting across channels. And the Mont Blanc and the Emo collided. And there was a resulting fire, and the um, Emo was uh, incapacitated, and the munition ship, Mont Blanc, drifted up to the uh, dock at Halifax. And the fire that started ended up being an explosion. And it had megatons of TNT mm -hmm. on board. When that thing exploded, in a matter of seconds, it totally wiped out the city of Halifax, all the way up the hill. People couldn't find their home. They didn't know where their house was because it was leveled just like the pictures we've seen of the atomic bombs, mm. Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And when they, you hear about the explosion in Japan of those two atomic bombs, they relate to the Halifax explosion as being the basis for that it's so unbelievable. The Mont Blanc was blown across in a 32-foot high tsunami wave across the harbor up onto the shore of the other city of Dartmouth. Also, that tsunami wiped out Richmond, which was the next city up above Halifax, and it wiped that out. And that was a big rail center. It was just unbelievable. Mm. There was, how many did I say? There was. 11,000 casualties, 2,000 died, and 25,000 people made homeless in a matter of seconds. Mm. Well, when you look into Dr. William Ladd, they uh, responded, and I'd like to read from the book what that is, because it says it better than I can say it. One of the first Boston doctors to arrive in Halifax after the blast, Dr. William Ladd headed a Boston Red Cross contingent of 22 doctors, 69 nurses, 14 civilians, plus enough equipment and supplies to set up a temporary 560-bed hospital at St. Mary's College. They stayed for almost a month, not leaving until January 5, 1918. Before they did, the views of the Red Cross on disaster relief and Dr. Ladd's medicine had changed significantly. The Red Cross decided to specialize in disaster uh, response, while Dr. Ladd's experience working with burned children in Halifax sparked insight into pediatric surgery. <clears throat> Upon Dr. Ladd's return to Boston, the Boston Children's Hospital designated two beds for his practice. From this modest beginning, Dr. Ladd built North America's preeminent pediatric surgery ward. Dr. Ladd's pioneering work is credited with developing pediatric, pediatric surgery as a separate discipline in the Western Hemisphere. The Great Halifax Explosion set in motion ripples we still feel today, including advances in international relations. While the disaster of the American response to it created a formal policy 
between the two nations, any talk of American annexing Canada stopped after that. So the United States was going to take over Canada before that explosion. Wow. But after that explosion, a friendship developed, mm. which exists today. So it's not just Fox, uh, Easton, it's not just Boston, it's international. In 1924, Canada's legislature decided the nation should stop driving on the left side of the street just because the British did the same thing. <laughs> Helped promise, promote trade and tourism with the Americans. So I, I, I think that's significant. It really is. What I wanted to be able to <laughs> let pe pe people become aware of that. It's well, Dr. William Ladd was a giant and, and a pioneer. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, most of the pioneering work he did emanated from this horrible event, exactly. this terrible explosion. Exactly. Yeah. And um, and he was Bill Ladd's dad. Right. So it's uh, his legacy. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Yeah, well, I. This is so interesting. Yeah. And the name of the book is. The Great Halifax Explosion. A World War I story of treachery, tragedy, and extraordinary heroism. By John U. Bacon. John U. Bacon. Yes. Bacon. Yeah. Right. So that looks like incredible reading. That should reading. be in everybody's library. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure it's at the, at the Ames Free Library. I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah. It should be. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ed, so much. Oh. And I know we'll be continuing with another segment. So I want to thank the uh, listening audience for your attention and enjoyment, I'm sure, <laughs> of this wonderful uh, storyteller, Ed Leonard, who's joined us today. Thank you for watching. Be well. <laughs>